Okay, let's talk about gore. <laughs> uh, gore is not exclusive to horror movies, uh, which I'm recording this in kind of like the horror season, if you will, of Halloween. Um, but it's uh, but it is certainly something that horror movies are known for, but also violent video games, things like that, and it can be a, a point of concern among some Christians that other Christians are enjoying entertainment with gore and blood and and those kinds of things. Um, I myself many times have no issue with gore. In fact, sometimes I very much appreciate it. And uh, that's part of what I want to explore here. I don't have any notes. I my week was a little bit crunched, and I realized, oh crap. Well, I will want to. I do want to create some kind of like a biblical c content that we can explore together. But uh, so, but but consider, you know, that my thoughts are pretty off the cuff. I've got some Bible verses that I, I pulled up to kind of take a look at. But uh, uh, this is mostly a a conversation starter or something to provide a little food for thought as we all kind of continue processing this. So by all means, share your thoughts in the comments of the, the YouTube video. Um, what I'm not going to say is that, oh, gore is great. Christians should never have any problems with gore. We should all be comfortable with gore and blood and all that kind of stuff in movies. That's, uh, that's overly simplistic. But I also think it's overly simplistic when some Christians will say, you know, we should not have anything to do with things that uh, have entertainment where the human body is being mutilated or people are, you know, there's, there's gore and blood and, and the assumption that can come with that kind of con expressed concern that uh, such use of gore and blood is a glorifying of violence and it's uh, feeding into a sinful bloodthirstiness in those who are taking part in that kind of entertainment. I think that that assumption about the nature of the use of gore and blood in entertainment, and m even much more so, the assumption about the mental state of those who are engaging with that kind of entertainment, that also is overly simplistic. So what I, you know, if, if, I, if I were to have a bottom line statement uh, that I would want to put out there is, hey, this isn't that simple. So we shouldn't just jump to broad assumptions about interacting with entertainment that has lots of gore and blood. Why do I say that? Well, because there are depictions, very bloody depictions, of this kind of violence in the Bible. And so we have to figure out, well, what, what's going on there? I don't think it's as simple as saying, well, the Bible did it, so, you know, that that's the exception to the rule. Okay, but why did the, the, the human writers inspired by the Holy Spirit use these kinds of images? And how can they do that without being sinful? Or, you know, how, how can they do that? And God put his stamp of approval on this kind of expression. So let's actually uh, jump to some of what I'm talking about here. Uh, let's see, got to get that. Okay, there we go. So uh, first up, uh, Psalm 58 is the first one that came to mind. I made a video about an episode of The Boys that I'll try to link to below the YouTube version of this uh, content. Um, but this psalm came up because it was quoted, just a particular snippet of it was quoted. And this, uh, let me just read Psalm 58. It's, it's pretty short. In the ESV, it says, Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Or that can also be translated, you mighty lords. Uh, do you judge the children of man uprightly? No. In your hearts you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. Um, perhaps that means estranged from God. I don't know. I'm not going to do a deep dive of this psalm here. They go astray from birth speaking lies. So they're just on the wrong path is, is what this psalm is saying. They have, and, and in the verse prior, your hands deal out violence on the earth. So we're talking about people that are just far removed from what God uh, calls us to in life. They are being physically violent. Um, 58.4, they have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear. So they're doing stuff that is lethal. Um, and they are unable to be persuaded to stop because in this case, the adder is deaf. So as it says in verse five of 58, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or the cunning enchanter. It's not able to be swayed, shifted from its desire, its impulse to strike out and do lethal harm. Um, Psalm 58, 6. Oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions. Oh yeah, I gotta do some laundry a little bit later. Okay, hopefully I'll remember that. Uh, so this 
prayer is calling for violence to be done to those who are doing deadly violence. It's not just violence out of nowhere. It's violence to people that are that are killing us. Break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O Yahweh. Let them vanish like water that runs away. When he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime. So just like utterly disintegrated and gone. Like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Just completely snuffed out and like not even seen. Sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. And there's some ambiguity among scholars about what is actually meant by, by this phrase here, so I'm not going to really make any comments on that. But here's the verse that, is, that was quoted in the boys, and that is a really striking verse when we think about this topic of blood, bloody imagery. Psalm 58.10, The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance, he will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. And then finally, verse 11, mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Uh, now we, uh, if you're listening to this, watching this, chances are very good that you are not under the kind of oppression that Israel was very familiar with at this time, where other nations were killing them, killing their children. It was horrific. I mean, our all of our attempts at going to see movies for entertainment, I mean, gosh, they, they were living this stuff for real. You know, you want to talk about PTSD, that was the order of the day. They were so screwed up, I'm sure, from this horrific life that they were all commonly experiencing. And so it's in light of that, that this prayer goes up to God. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Now, this is, this is poetry, so is that literally a thing that's going to happen? Uh, that's not clear to me, um, but it's a very striking image, and we have to figure out, well, what does this mean? Does this mean that we're allowed to be bloodthirsty when we've been wronged? No, I think what we see here is language not celebrating bloody violence and gore and stuff like that, but language that uses that imagery to convey that the enemy is utterly defeated. Utterly defeated. Um, let's go through, and there's a few other verses like this. Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimsoned garments from Basra? He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. And this is a picture of the Lord um, as a, a, a divine avenger of wrongs. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? Answer, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart and my year of redemption had come." Um, so this is a vision, a picture of the Lord finally bringing an end to the evils of the world, uh, the horrific, violent, uh, deadly evils of the world. And the picture we have here, I think, is one that conveys it, it is utterly dealt with. When we're talking about his garments being uh, reddened like someone who's been working in the wine press, their lifeblood spatted on my garments. Um, that's really intense imagery there. Revelation 14, verse 19. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Verse 20. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1600 stadia. So again, there's some poetic or prophetic language going on here. How much of this is going to play out in this literal exact fashion? Uh, we can't really know. But the, the language shifts from being of a wine press to being blood, blood coming from the wine press, as high as a horse's bridle. So, I mean, like, there are people, I mean, deep enough to be swimming in this amount of blood. 
Uh, again, I have reason to think that that's not going to be a literal thing that happens, but rather is this picture of the utter defeat of evil. Uh, it, like, it is so ridiculously <laughs> over-expressed in this language that the result can only we can only conclude wow okay so the enemy is just wasted they are brought to nothing finally revelation 19 verse 13 similar kind of idea his clo he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of god so again this is in this context of the lord well let's see here verse 14 and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen white and pure were following him on white horses here we go 15 revelation 19 15 from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of god the almighty now if that seems like really harsh in today's day and age then be grateful that today is not as bad as it's going to be by this point um, this is, this is Jesus coming to deal with a world that has gone horrifically wrong. Um, and this level of defeat of evil will be something that people are grateful for and thrilled about because of what comes before it. And so we have to, we have to kind of see it in that context. Um, the, the truth is that... Uh, despite all of this language, God does not himself even take pleasure in uh, this process of utterly defeating evil, um, evil people. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. The context is like, where's the Lord? Why is he not returned? He's not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that's a different topic about, like, as we are waiting, Lord, why don't you intervene? Why don't you do something? Well, because when the time comes for him to really come and intervene and deal with all sin, that's the end of it. Before then, he's waiting and giving as much opportunity as he can for everyone to make a shift and to turn to him. Um, Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Have I, any, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? And a similar idea expressed a few chapters later, Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. This time he's talking to Israel, because Israel had gone totally off course. Um, this is probably one of the instances where they were adopting the practices of the nations around them. Maybe at this time they were, they were even like baking their children, offering them up to Moloch in, uh, in the horrific sacrifices. But Israel went bad, and this is one of those instances. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? So, um, coming back to Psalm 58, verse 10, the righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. I think when we look at the totality of Scripture and how God is viewing these moments, um, we see them described with some intense uh, bloody language, but we also see scripture elsewhere saying, God is not taking pleasure in these moments. And yet, and so I, so I think what we draw from that is, well, if he's not taking pleasure in it, then that kind of language must be about conveying something else. And I am convinced, um, until I hear a better explanation, that the consistent view of scripture is that this, this is about God, God painting a picture of how utterly and decisively he's going to deal with evil when the time comes. So, how does that circle back uh, to um, uh, to gore in movies and stuff like that? Um, when I personally am watching like a gory movie or something, there are two times when I appreciate gore. One, and this would be the lesser of the two, but one would be times where uh, someone is being wronged, some, and some, someone or something evil 
is doing something horrible and they are they are just like utterly killing torturing somebody i don't enjoy that i appreciate that because of how it sets up the 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 dramatic problem that there is an a horrible immense evil here so that's usually in a horror movie um i don't I'll need gore to do this for me but there are times where it accentuates this um and so when it serves that purpose and i feel it serving that purpose i think it, it it serves a good purpose for my personal experience engaging with that kind of entertainment because the heart cry in me sounds out all the louder no that must be stopped this is a horrible evil that must be stopped and so it creates uh this sense of anticipation for wrongs to be righted and so when the hero of the story finally uh, is victorious or survives and gets away from that horrible evil sometimes that's all you get at the end of a horror movie is they just survive and they're safe then it's so much more satisfying okay they're safe from the evil the evil has been dealt with they're they're away from it forever or the evil has been defeated and that was a horrible evil that needed to be defeated so that's one instance where i find gore to be useful and actually part of um uh bringing out of me what is a very god-honoring sentiment that evil must be dealt with our hearts ought to cry out for that the 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 second way um and probably more frequently i'm thinking specifically of video games but also sometimes in like Zack snyder movies like 300 the other type of gore that i can appreciate is when the hero the protagonist um takes out an enemy and there's just like a, like an overabundance of gore like a slow motion blood splatter it's like you know there's not that much blood in the human body i don't think <laughs> you know so it could just kind of look ridiculous um but in those moments the way that strikes me is communicating whoa that dude was destroyed that enemy that bad guy that whatever that had been a problem before that had been a source of oppression and evil or something before um that he is done <laughs> <laughs> you know or something similar like when a head flies off or something like that you know this kind of gore that is about the about evil being utterly dealt with uh does speak to me and is satisfying and i think in a godly way in i think actually a scriptural way as i've kind of been reflecting on the use of blood and gore in the bible so uh but of course it does uh this does mean that if, if we are going to allow for the idea that blood and gore can be useful in fiction, we, even knowing that possibility, can't just assume that that's going to be the net result. As in all things, we do need to uh, shape our minds as we are engaging with different types of entertainment. And um, we have to choose to take from the entertainment or find in the entertainment or bring to the entertainment that which is God honoring, that which is from a biblical perspective. Um, and so what's going to happen, I think, is that some Christians um, are going to ex both experience the same thing and have very different feelings about that experience, even though they just watch the same scene in the same movie, you know, um, and so I think we need to be gracious and allow room for Christians to experience things differently. Some people, because of their own personal experiences, are just not going to naturally, or even if they try, get into the headspace of seeing gore ever as a useful part of their experience, as something that God might use to stimulate in them worthwhile thought. Um, other geeks, uh, like I think sometimes happens for me, it'll be very natural for that to happen. But then I think there's the middle category that uh, could choose, I think, um, as, as we all should, because I mean, it doesn't always come naturally to me to, to see and experience gore this way. Uh, but I think we can choose to shape our minds with truth, to allow the Holy Spirit to be guiding what uh, we're thinking about as we are engaging with this kind of fiction, this kind of entertainment, and I think for uh, many believers, they might be surprised um, to discover that there are there's worthwhile things that come from intentionally and biblically engaging with entertainment that has blood and gore elements in it. 
So anyway, uh, would be curious what your thoughts are. What are you kind of re reflecting on, pondering in light of that? Uh, you can let me know in the comments below. For more chat about geek entertainment, answers to your questions, and news from the wider world of Christian geekery, get the Christian Geek Central podcast today on iTunes and other podcast services.